Welcome to another video on the Databricks platform security series on YouTube. Really happy to have you here today and talk through some business continuity and disaster recovery specifics uh, when we're talking about Databricks. My name is Greg Wood. I'm a uh, specialist solution architect here at Databricks. I've been here for a little over five years and have been working on DR pretty closely for the past two years or so. Hey, I'm Lauren. I'm a delivery solutions architect. I've been with Databricks coming up on four years, and I've been working on DR pretty closely for, I think, three and a half of those almost four. So pretty much the whole time I've been at Databricks. So uh, we're going to talk through quite a few pieces of this this whole DR thing today. But just to, to kick us off here, I want to make sure I point out the uh, Security and Trust Center. Hugely valuable asset that the team has worked really hard on putting together over the past year or so. Uh, we kicked it off, I think it was the last you know, Data AI Summit. Please do check that out. So if you're watching this video, I probably don't need to tell you that DR is, is mostly a matter of when and not if. Uh, if you haven't been impacted by an outage on a cloud or on a service, you're either lucky or you haven't been uh, operating on that cloud or service for very long. Uh, you know, Unfortunately, these things do happen. And unfortunately, more often than not, they do have real business impact. Almost every customer that we talk to here at Databricks is starting to think about if they don't have a plan already. And so when you talk about business continuity in DR, really there's four main pillars. Uh, the first is uptime, RTO, which means you know when a service has some kind of degradation or outage, how long does it take me to get back to fully operational? So if EC2 or S3 or ADLS or you know Azure VMs go out, uh, right now, how long is it going to take me to recover those services and start operating again? Second pillar is RPO, which basically means, you know, that's the state of consistency. All right. So if a outage happens right now, how much data did I lose? So if I'm only doing backups every half hour, I lost a half hour of data. If I only do backups once a day, I could lose up to a day of data. Disaster control solutions themselves have a cost. If everybody could just have fully active, active system where I have no downtime. And as soon as an outage happens, that instant, my system flips over to another region and everything just works as is. It's great, but that costs a lot of money. Not only do you have to run services in multiple regions, but you have to have solutions to copy data between those. Data egress has costs. Uh, the solutions themselves might be proprietary. They might be from a vendor that you have to pay for. So again, that spectrum of costs. How much does it cost versus how much what risk am I willing to accept? And then finally, how much do I want to spend in both you know, having manual intervention, having somebody around the clock watching my systems, looking for uh, those outages and being ready to, to act? And how much time do I want to have my users uh, access issues? So that kind of moves us into right how you plan for disaster recovery and address these four different pillars, right? And it, it really comes down to uh, right five different activities that are required, right? Which is, is one planning, uh, right? Greg spoke about RTO, RPO. Uh, essentially, you just need to decide how much downtime and how much data loss your business can tolerate, and then. Right from there, that kind of gives you an initial starting point on the spectrum he discussed, and you can slide it left or right based on cost. The initial downtime that you are willing to tolerate is very expensive, and, and you might adjust and shift on that spectrum uh, to accept a longer downtime for a right less costly solution. From there, once we kind of have this business planning, we understand how disaster recovery fits into the overall business continuity plan. Uh, we start moving into an analysis. And with analysis, this is basically just trying to understand how all of our systems uh, connect, integrate, uh, what are our processes, you know, what is manual, what is automated. Uh, do we have any disaster recovery today that we can, you know, plug into or leverage? We do our analysis. We have a very good understanding of where we're at, where we want to be. The next thing we really need to think about is testing, right? Um, and just like test-driven development, we really want to do test-driven disaster recovery because there's, there's no point in a disaster recovery solution if you can't prove it's not working. Maintenance plan as well is also going to be critical. Disaster recovery solution is only good if it's working. 
final piece of this is execution, right? So when the disaster recovery uh, solution is implemented, how are you gonna execute it? How do you notify end users that they need to switch over to the disaster side, right? How do you actually do that switch over? Notify everyone to switch back once the outage resolved and do that switch back. Then the, the final piece that really connects all of this together is monitoring. Okay, so we just kind of want to talk about like what is a typical scenario uh, for data processing that you would generally want to have a disaster recovery solution for. We can see all the way on the left uh, in the yellow arrow, there's RPO. And again, to Greg's point, this is just the time between the most recent backup and the outage. We have this other yellow arrow, RTO, from the start of the outage. How much downtime can the business tolerate uh, before we have to be back up to full functionality or like an agreed upon uh, subset of functionality? Uh, failure occurs in the primary region. We're gonna start investigating internally. You know, We may realize it's some SaaS vendor or cloud services provider. We reach out, we do joint investigation. What we're ultimately gonna have to decide is can we wait for remediation? Right? Again, this is gonna be based on our RTO. Um, and is our secondary region impacted or not? There's three very high level activities in the failover. First, we, we wanna stop everything we can in the primary region. Not always possible because there is an outage, uh, but basically this allows us to gracefully shut down the primary region so that when it does come back online, we don't begin processing data there. And this helps reduce duplicate data between primary and secondary region. We start recovery in the secondary region. Then we're gonna test the secondary region, make sure it's operational. Once that happens, we're gonna to communicate to everyone. We're gonna switch over our workloads to run on the secondary region. We're gonna stay this way until the incident is mitigated. Once that happens, we're gonna fail back to our primary region. And we have pretty much the same, just in kind of reverse order, right? So we're gonna stop all of our activities in the secondary region. We start the recovery process in primary, test the primary region, make sure it's up running operational. And the final step that's new here, right? It's data replication to the primary region. That brings us to our primary region being operational. We can now communicate to end users that it is back online, they should switch over um, and right, the primary region's ready to receive the workloads. And then just to dive a little bit deeper in analysis, right? Now that we have kind of an agreed upon typical scenario, right, here's what happens for analysis. Out of planning, we have output. Uh, from those outputs, we have to identify what are the critical data services. We have to come into agreement with the business on what RPO and RTO is. Those three things are super important because that's gonna be the foundation of the disaster recovery solution, defining what's in scope, uh, right, basically measuring out where we are on this spectrum from, you know, very fast failover fell back, very complex and costly to just waiting out the outage. Uh, from there, we got to map the critical integration points, processes with uh, kind of like humans in the loop, human intervention, as well as things that are fully automated. We have to understand where people are involved in the processes and how to manage that if a certain person is unavailable during a disaster recovery event, right? Who has the ownership to make decisions in their place, um, right? And then we also need to identify any upstream data services and point of integration that are necessary for our services to continue running in secondary region. So in downstream data consumption, kind of uh, same concept making sure that any dashboards are also accounted for, right? This may be Tableau, Power BI. They're going to have to have configurations that need to be updated so that they're pointing to the correct Databricks workspace in the secondary region. And finally, we have third-party integrations, right? This is where Databricks, Power BI, Tableau come in. These are third parties. Uh, they're going to be important integrations though. So it's very, critical to work with the vendors, understand the integration and the work that needs to be done as part of failover fillback for each. Finally, we have assess available tools, right? We're basically just trying to take an inventory of what exists to see how much work there is to do in implementing the solution.
high level number one, right? We got to understand what's critical to the business um, and has to have a disaster recovery solution. If it's not critical, it really shouldn't be in the scope of disaster recovery. Um, and DR specifically, that's like the technology pieces, whereas business continuity, it can be a broader scope of criticality. Clearly uh, identify what services are in scope, what data is being processed, uh, the data flow and storage location. All right, so the third one is isolating services and data as much as possible. You don't necessarily want your services to have hard-coded storage prefixes. You wanna to try to parameterize those or use configuration files so that they can be easily swapped out. Or this is a little more Databricks specific, but to be honest, this is pretty uh, standard for platform providers and uh, SaaS vendors. It's the customer's responsibility to maintain integrity between their primary and secondary deployments, right, in the respective regions. Last one for number five. For Delta tables, we always recommend Delta Deep Clone. Um, there are, as always, there are some trade-offs, but this provides better consistency and much lower risk of data corruption than bucket-level cloud service provider replication tools. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, just to wrap it up here. Um, so part one, obviously we talked about a lot of very high level, you know, sort of DR and business continuity, um, a little bit more abstracted. Part two, we'll go into a little bit more about some more of how the tools that we offer and, and things that we see customers doing to flesh out their, their BCDR strategy on Databricks. But just to recap here, uh, you know, BC is a, it is a really broad topic. Uh, it's bigger than just DR. Uh, but it touches on every part of the strategy uh, and disaster recovery is obviously a central part of that and helps mitigate risk uh, pretty much no matter what. Um, no matter what, these both require a lot of planning as you've seen, right? Just in, in this video, there's a lot to think about. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of guides out there. There's a lot of tools out there. Uh, you know, hopefully these, these videos will help make some of that more clear. We also do have some, some resources on our blog uh, Lauren has had a big hand in a lot of these, so do uh, do check those out. Again, we'll have a part two up shortly, and uh, make sure you check out the Security and Trust Center as well. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks, Lauren, for uh, joining me on this, and we'll see you on the next one.